All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Ahmed Zaid. I am a postdoctoral scholar with Dr. Matthew Sullivan and Dr. Virginia Rich uh, here at Ohio State University. I am going to be um, uh, leading this session today for the Advanced Ecological Statistics. So this is going to be the last session for the Microbiome Informatics webinar series. Um, so yes, we're here. Uh, we have been through a long way uh, through uh, all of these different and diverse sessions um, with all of the teachers um, that have, 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 have contributed to this webinar series. And today I'm going to be talking about some of the advanced ecological statistics that you can apply to your data. Um, if, of course, it's not gonna be a comprehensive uh, course on statistics or uh, um, even scratching the surface uh, for, for talking about something like that. So today we are going to be uh, mainly talking about three uh, different things. The first part of my presentation today is going to be about sharing some resources with you. Again, uh, this presentation, these two hours is not gonna be covering everything. So I'm gonna give you some leads to some of the um, uh, available resources that are out there uh, that you can consult and you can um, build upon the knowledge that you have and um, enrich what you know about the ecological statistics that you can uh, use. Um, and then I'm going to switch to a specific type of analysis, and this is employing network analytics in order to link some of your data. So this is specifically your microbial lineages, your viral um, populations, your um, genes of interest, your transcripts, your proteomes, um, to the environmental data and to the ecosystem outputs. And after I talk um, for some time about um, uh, how to do this and the different ways that um, people do in it. And um, I'm gonna be contrasting what are the benefits and uh, uh, shortcomings of each uh, way. Um, I'm going to finally end up with going over the code that uh, we have shared with you online. Um, and this code basically employs uh, WGCNA. So this is weighted gene or genome correlation network analysis. Uh, so it's a type of network uh, analysis and that is combined with partially square regression and uh, extraction of variables. Um, and we're gonna be doing this um, together so that we can actually understand the different parts of the code and um, what you can uh, change in them so that you can actually have uh, meaningful results from your data. So I am going to start with the resources. Um, I am pretty confident that this has been shared with you already uh, in previous sessions, but again, I'm gonna be uh, having uh, these on my slides and I'm going to share uh, the few slides that I have here for the resources with you on, um, again on the online link that we have on the page of the Center of Microbiome Science um, so that you can um, click on these and go to um, uh, these different links when you don't have to jot down anything that is uh, uh, displayed on the screen right now. So uh, you are going to uh, need some software, of course, and um, in order to run some of the statistical packages that you uh, will apply to your data. And um, I'm showing you here basically a link for the um, uh, Center of Microbiome Science. And there are um, some resources that are listed there, uh, some primers for using R, and there are also other resources outside um, of Coursera, edX, and other resources as well. And you will be able to find some tutorials uh, for the basics of R and Python. And um, these are the main two, I guess, uh, software people are using for uh, doing statistics and uh, microbiome science. Uh, there are also some GitHub links for some of them to list some of the topics that, and, uh, that are specific to statistics. So how to apply, st how to do statistical analyses on your categorical data how to do them on your continuous data and also some advanced things um, like building a predictive model and um, um, be able in, in, and that to be able to employ machine learning um, in your analyses. 
And uh, of course, this is one of the very famous resources that are available to um, microbial ecologists. So this is uh, Gustami. It's a very nice resource because it includes, of course, some basics and some advanced um, concepts. Um, but also it's nicely linked together. It gives you a contrast and comparison between the different things that you can do on your data sets. Um, and for example, if we're talking about ordination, um, it will walk you through um, doing metric versus non-metric ordination, uh, multidimensional scaling, for example. And um, um, it has really simple statistics as well as uh, more complex things such as doing multivariate analyses, etc. Um, so this is one of the things that I would recommend that you uh, periodically visit to uh, look at the types of analyses that um, can be done in this domain and critically examine your data and see which type of analyses are suitable for uh, the data set that you have. And there is YouTube. YouTube is actually a very good resource as well. Uh, this is one of the channels that I really like. It's called StatQuest. And it's run by a um, uh, renowned statistician and mathematician. And uh, this person is um, uh, making it easy for people who are not familiar with more of the uh, complicated concepts um, in the statistics that they actually break it down and explain them in a really easy terms. Uh, as you can see in all of these thumbnails, everything is clearly explained. Everything is pretty easy. Of course, not everything is like that, but um, I uh, highly recommend visiting this channel as well and learning more about the um, core concepts behind the analyses or behind the packages that you use in, um, uh, in, in your day-to-day -day analyses. Uh, of course, there are some tutorials for the uh, statistical packages that exist out there that you can import in R or Python, for example. Um, so, for example, I have here um, the first link is for the package vegan and then also how to do multivariate stats, multivariate stats with uh, vegan. And what I want to say is that uh, you don't have to be married to one specific statistical package and that's the one that you're going to use all the way. So uh, there are m multiple ones that are out there. And usually people develop these because they uh, get frustrated about um, some of the packages that already exist. And they feel like, well, uh, they have to actually write a lot of code or design their specific functions uh, so that they can do like really simple things. So there is a reason behind developing newer packages, right? Uh, they want to basically fill a gap in the um, in the existing uh, an available list of, of software. So you can easily um, load a package and use a function that you like and then unload it and load the, another, the other one and um, use it for a different thing. So try to think about, um, uh, try to have this as a strategy usually in your um, um, coding and it's because it's gonna save you a lot of time. So the example that I have here is like for a package that's called microbiome. And again, I'm providing here a link for um, um, a tutorial for how to use this package. And um, the example that I'm showing you here is that you can actually use their alpha function. Um, and this function is going to give you all of the different uh, alpha diversity indices into one nice table. If you would um, use vegan to do the same thing, you would have to actually call uh, different functions in order to get these in the individual indices. So you would have to call Shannon uh, function and then you would have to call the richness function. Um, it, so uh, this is now like just one liner and actually it's a couple of lines like the calculation of the alpha diversity, storing that into a variable and then calling the table and here you go, you have everything you need. Uh, of course, there is Phylosic, one of the famous packages as well, and there's a link for uh, a tutorial um, on it. And there are less, uh, some less known uh, packages that I'm going to um, also uh, leave to you on these slides. Um, and, and again, another example that there is a package called Pathostat. It's going to give you like a really nice uh, display of the temporal variation in your data. So each color here represents different uh, lineage in the uh, data set. 
and uh, it's showing that the changes in the relative abundance um, across time or across individuals. So try to uh, go through these things and look at what it's, what's available before trying to um, reinvent the wheel, if I might say. Um, trying to R, they have a nice um, way to overlay your statistical data on phylogenetic trees. So here it's basically showing you the log twofold change in the different, uh, in the abundance of different lineages um, as they are placed in the phylogenetic tree. They give you statistical support notations on the tree. Um, so I guess I made my point clear now. There are a lot more um, uh, packages that are available out there. Some of them are specialized in the um, visualization and um, analysis of networks. Uh, some other ones are um, specialized in doing some sparse statistical tests. Uh, so this is, for example, speech easy. Uh, some of them are specialized in uh, doing phylogenetic trees and so on and so forth. So all of these things, again, are going to be available on the um, online link uh, that you visit periodically for um, the recorded lectures as well as the um, shared material. And there are a couple of readings that um, I like, and I have actually um, encountered these uh, from Dr. Sharif, uh, one of the teachers who um, actually taught in this webinar series. He, um, uh, gave you the primer on using uh, high compute um, uh, machines and also on the basic ecological statistics and using Chime, etc. So these are good reads. I, I would advise anyone to read them as well. All right, so uh, we're going to start talking about the uh, networks and how to use them to link your microbial lineages or viral lineages, uh, um, your genes, your transcripts and proteins to ecosystem outputs. And this is basically because we have a lot of these in our data sets. So uh, the scale of the data increases um, um, a lot with, uh, with like the, the advances in technology that we have right now. So it's not, uh, um, uncommon now to see thoughts in one data set uh, across different samples and across time, across space. Um, and you can even see hundreds of thousands of viruses, millions of transcripts and proteins. And all of these are um, now under your hands and you wanna um, understand what potentially they can be doing to uh, the ecosystem uh, that these microbes exist in. So it's a difficult problem and it's get, it gets more and more difficult as the scale of the data increase or the size of the data increases. So I think the difficulty comes from the, um, like the, the, the kind of like the, the complexity of doing statistical tests. data sets. So let me use three variables. Um, these are actually environmental measurements. So this is methane concentration or methane flux. This is oxygen concentration in uh, pore water a soil sample. This is water uh, table depth. And you have collected multiple samples. So these are your observations or error. So you want to uh, correlate a couple of these in variables to each other in your data set. And this is just like the entire data set be easy to do Pearson correlation, Spearman correlation, or just do direct regression between the two variables that you are interested in. So if your methane flux is your uh, response variable, you can easily regress that against your um, uh, predictor variable, which let's say it's the water table depth. But then you add the microbial data or the viral data or the genomic or the gene data or the transcripted data. And now the number of variables um, explodes. So you can have thousands or tens of thousands of these columns. And now you run into a problem. And this problem we call the large P small n problem. Uh, you have large number of variables and small number of uh, observations or samples. 
And because you are doing so many statistical tests, if you imagine that you want to know which microbial lineage out of all of these um, can play a role in methane flux, that you know, like the naive approaches to actually try and correlate every and single one of them uh, to methane flux. So you'd be doing too many statistical tests, thousands of them, um, to the end to like, to the extent that you are losing power. So you are basically uh, um, uh, getting a lot of these correlations by chance and now you have a lot of false positives so that would destroy any significance if you are trying to do correction for multiple testing um, and you cannot basically do that at all so the approach that people have been following for um, so long to solve this problem is to actually reduce the um, size of the data so the, reduce the dimensionality in their data or uh, follow the dimensional reduction approaches. And uh, what that means is that you're trying to collapse uh, these uh, different variables that are also autorelated into uh, modules or, or into clusters, and then use these um, to try to understand the changes that are happening in your ecosystem. This is usually is followed by doing some variable extraction. So uh, variable extraction is basically trying to look for what is the uh, most important member of each of the uh, clusters that are emerging from the dimensionality reduction here. So to give you an example that is kind of like well known to um, many of you, I, I presume, is when you do uh, something like ordination analysis. So in your Dimension analysis, you are trying to collapse the all of your data across all of the dimensions into two dimensions, right? The, the first principal coordinate or component and the second um, principal component or, um, or principal coordinate. And you try to look at the uh, pattern that appears in this 2D space. And some people would overlay on top of this pattern or this clustering the environmental data, or in this case, the, or the um, overlaying the uh, abundances of the uh, different lineages or different genera in the data set, okay? And from that, they would say, well, now we did this dimensionality reduction. Now we can actually correlate this crime bacterium to uh, the clusters that we have in this 2D space, okay? And they would say, for example, yeah, crime bacterium is enriched in this cluster, and um, this cluster is associated with this specific um, uh, diagnosis of patients. So probably this coronary bacteria um, are involved in the pathogenesis that are related to this uh, disease. But there are a couple of problems here. And uh, these problems are that you look at the resolution that is displayed here, this is genus level, right? So it's, it's gonna work with your environmental data if you are collecting, you know, less than 100 uh, environmental measurements, if you are looking at uh, a handful of uh, families or genera. So that would work. But if you are trying to look at high resolution, so if you're looking at uh, species and new species, or even you're trying to look at individual um, strains, then things start to get messy because you're going to get so many different units that are autocorrelated that are pointing towards this direction. So this is the first problem. The second problem is that you look at the variation explained on this axis, it doesn't have to be really high. It doesn't have to be explaining all of the variation of your data. So in a case like this, where you have only 29 of the variation explained, then yeah, coronavirus is explaining this clustering in your two-dimensional space, but this clustering itself is only explained by 29% of, the, um, of, of this specific, or like this specific coordination is only explained by 29% on the first axis. So cryobacterium is kind of tied to whatever percentage explained on these two axes. So uh, in order to circumvent all of that, we can actually try to use some of the um, dedicated clustering software that exists out there. Um, this is not a comprehensive list. This is just some examples and um, just to um, give you an idea of like the um, variations in the underlying um, algorithms that are behind these clustering techniques as well. 
and you try to cluster your data, your microbes, my, your viruses, your genes based on their um, co-occurrence, um, based on if we're talking about genes based on their co-expression, um, if we're talking about viruses or microbes based on uh, their correlation um, across different samples. We're not going to be talking about all of these. We're, we're mainly going to be comparing WGCNA, MCL, and SNCC for specific reasons that I'm going to mention uh, when we um, uh, go to their specific slides. And the idea is really simple. So let's imagine that every single line that we have here in this plot represents a different lineage or a different gene or a different transcript. And you have all of your samples here on the x-axis and you have the abundance represented here on the y-axis. So what these softwares try to do is basically uh, deconstruct this uh, mess right here into different profiles, okay? And these different profiles are going to represent different clusters. And as of course, the number of samples increase, that means the profile shape is going to be more complicated and you will end up having more and more clusters. So if we can just like hypothetically say that we only have three clusters that we can, or three profiles that we can extract from uh, this initial um, abundance distribution, uh, you can start um, to fit um, each of these lines to one of these three different profiles and you end up having these different separate um, clusters. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be um, um, always matching at every single sample for every single gene or transcript or, um, or microbe or virus. But, you know, it has to be good enough. So, um, as I told you, I'm going to be doing the um, uh, comparison today between these three different softwares. Um, and I'm going to be mainly focusing on uh, WGCNA um, because it's a really powerful um, platform um, um, that we have under our hands. But I'm going to compare uh, what you can get and how WGCNA work um, relative to other softwares um, such as MCL um, or SNCC. So the workflow that we are going to be talking about today is uh, basically uh, composed of three different steps. So the first step is to construct a network. Um, this network is built uh, from the correlations between the different lineages that you have here and your own data. And WGCNA, uh, as I told you, stands for weighted gene co-expression, correlation or co-occurrence network analysis. And the purpose of this step is, again, to do uh, dimensionality reduction and data simplification. Um, so the purpose is to actually get to the clusters or to get to the modules. We follow on that by doing some uh, regression analysis. So um, today we're going to be talking about partially square regression. And uh, this is a nice technique that allows you to do regression and also cross-validation. So you can actually uh, look at how your inference uh, when you try to correlate the members of the specific modules that you have selected from the first step against the environmental variables. And the last step in the workflow is to use the um, a technique called the variable importance in projection. And that allows you to extract the uh, variable that can explain um, the variation that you are seeing in your, um, uh, in your data. So for the first step, as I told you, you are trying to basically build a network. And a network is composed of nodes and edges. So every circle here is a node. And these are the different microbes or viruses or genes that you have in your data set. And the lengths here that are connecting these circles are the edges. And it is basically the correlation between these, uh, these two microbes and your data set. So you are connecting these nodes based on the strength of the correlation um, between them across the entire data set. So um, the thickness of line here represents the strength of this correlation coefficient. If you have a um, correlation that's approaching one, you find a thick line. If you have a thin line here, that represents a weaker correlation. What WGCNA uh, tries to achieve is to actually define modules within uh, this network right here. So it's a very simple case that I'm showing you right uh, right now that, well, it looks like we can actually break this network into two different modules. 
the green module and the blue module. And actually, WGSNA call them um, uh, like this, like we call them by color. So once you get modules, you uh, the next step that you want to correlate these modules to um, the set of environmental variables that you have collected or the environmental measurements that you have collected. So what you're looking at here in this heat map is on the y-axis, you have the different modules or the sub-networks that you get from the first step. And on the x-axis here, you have the environmental variables that you have measured. And the uh, intensity of color here represent the strength of the correlation. If it's red, that's uh, positive correlation. If it's blue, it's negative correlation. And what you want to achieve from this is that you scan your heat map and look for the uh, of subnetworks that are showing um, high correlation coefficient. Um, and of course, with uh, decent statistical support um, represented here by the p-value. And you pick this pair right here. So if you are interested into methane flux in your ecosystem, and you found that there is a specific module or specific uh, subnetwork that can explain uh, the variation uh, or the uh, observed methane flux in the system, then you wanna focus all of your effort on the members that exist in the subnetwork. So that's what we, um, that's what, what, I, what I meant, data simplification rather than look all of the different microbes or viruses in, in your asset. Now you are just focused on a specific uh, subnetwork. You pick these and then you go to the next step. So the next step is to um, try to understand uh, the relative relationship of uh, the members of this module and how that relate to the uh, ecosystem output that you are trying to measure. Um, so in this case here, we are looking at the individual OTUs or genes or transcripts or proteins. And on the x-axis here, we have their membership on the module. Um, so uh, how well supported they are to be in that specific module. So you can think of this as the uh, first dimension of a principal component analysis. And on the y-axis here, we have the correlation to your ecosystem output or to your metadata. So again, the correlation, the direct correlation that you have between these and um, relative abundances between uh, uh, these individual OTUs and the metadata that you have measured here. So from this, you wanna focus on the OTUs or the genes or the transcripts that are in the upper right corner. So these are the things that are well supported in your module. They are the hub genes, the hub genomes in your um, module, and they are highly correlated to your environmental variable. So we, uh, usually at uh, this workflow follow um, up with an independent analysis and this analysis use the partially square regression. Um, so um, you again, just focus on the module that you have extracted from the WGCNA analysis and uh, try to regress that against your uh, metadata or the specific ecosystem output that you are interested in. And what partial risk square regression does is that it does regression, but also does the cross validation that I have just told you um, about a couple of slides ago. And that is by using different cross validation techniques. The one that I'm showing you here on the slide is the leap one out cross validation, which is basically you take out um, one of these dots, one of these OTUs, one of these uh, transcripts one by one and you calculate um, uh, the deterioration in the relationship that you are seeing between the two different uh, variables here on the x and the y axis. And by doing that, you can basically pinpoint or the genomes um, are important for the stability of this relationship and um, their importance also in their, in their module. So again, um, we call this x-axis the latent variable, the subnetwork membership, or the module membership. And again, you can think about it as the first dimension of our principal component analysis plot. And because you are trying to look at these different variables, um, there are um, techniques that you can apply to on the data that are uh, exported from this partially square regression in order to determine which variables um, that exist in this module um, that are the 
expected to be the most important for your ecosystem output. And the way to employ this is, uh, or you have like multiple lines now of analysis, right? The way to actually integrate all of this is to look at the consensus across all of them. So you, let's assume that you had a microbe or a gene that has a high correlation uh, with your ecosystem output, but actually it has a really bad um, VIB score on an, or there is another of technique called the selectivity ratio, but we're not going to be discussing today. Um, then you you would be cautious about making strong conclusions from this kind of like um, correlation because it might be just spurious correlation um, that resulted from having so many different um, members in your community and you're trying to do so many statistical tests. Uh, the same applies for the for example, you can have false you can have things that have a really high VIP score, but still have very bad or low correl direct correlation, Pearson correlation or Spiegelman correlation to the ecosystem output. So I wouldn't also trust uh, these cases. So what is going to be uh, the goal here is to look for the cases that are um, agreed upon by different methods. So the VIP methods that are coming from the partial least square regression, the normal coalition that's coming from the WGCNA, and maybe the uh, selectivity ratio that is coming from applying a different um, variable extraction method. All right, so I said that we are going to do this comparison between WGCNA, um, MCL, and SNCC. And um, I chose these three because they have very similar um, workflow. There are uh, key differences in the um, in this workflow and I just wanted to take these as good examples for um, uh, the awareness that you should have when you choose a method over the other okay so we already discussed this the first thing that WGCNA uh, does so we're going to compare it now to MCL so the first thing that it does is basically it constructs the network um, based on the correlation coefficient that you have between each pair of uh, microbes or viruses or proteins in your data set, okay? For MCL, um, it does something similar, but it uses the transition probabilities rather than the uh, correlation coefficient. So um, MCL stands for Markov clustering algorithm and people usually use this for protein clustering. And usually the input for this network is uh, something like um, um, the E value. So it's like protein similarity space, okay? It's rather than actually correlation, uh, abundance correlations, okay? Um, but I'm just like giving you an example. So they would use the E values, they transform that and they use it to build the edges here in this network right here. Uh, the second step after you get this uh, initial network is you try to uh, transform the edges in your network. And this transformation uh, happens in WGCNA by um, raising these edges to a power. Um, and you do this iteratively. So for example, you raise to a power of two, three, four, five, six, etc. Uh, you do this iteratively till you reach um, a topology in your network that we call a scale-free topology. We're going to be talking about this again, and we're going to uh, see exactly how to know that you have up, uh, reached the, the scale-free topology uh, in your network. This is going to be in the third uh, section when we go through the code. But basically, um, if you look at the number of connections in your network, um, once you have your scale-free topology, you should be expecting that most of the nodes in your data, most of the nodes of your data have very low number of connections. And you have actually few of the nodes in your data or in your network are highly connected. So you do this um, because you wanna have a stable um, topology. So the scale-free topology uh, network, as you add more and more nodes to it, as you add more and more connections to it, it uh, doesn't change its topology. So, and that's the purpose. You reach this kind of stability and you would be able to identify the um, hub or network as well. So for MCL, it does something similar. It's called different, it's called the inflation. 
So the insulation, um, it makes the rich richer, it makes the poor poorer. So basically it's again, transformation that is done on these edges. The strong edges are going to remain strong, or edges are going to be more and more weak. So if you have something that has a correlation of one and you raise it to a power of two, that's still gonna be one. But you have something that is a very low correlation, it's 0.2 and you raise it to a power of two, it becomes even less. The next step is to apply a higher, for WGCNA is to apply hierarchical clustering on the uh, on the network that has its edge, edges transformed to the extent that it reaches the scale-free topology. So after you reach the scale-free topology, you apply hierarchical clustering, and using this hierarchical using the clusters that uh, emerge from this dendrogram, as well as the um, network, the scale-free network. Um, scale-free topology network, you would be able to define the modules in this network. For MCL, it just does this inflation over and over and it does uh, pruning. So it starts to actually break the connection, some of the uh, edges in this network um, to a point where it reaches what's called a sparse network. So in this sparse network, you uh, basically aim for that every single node that you have in, in your network is connected to what is called a sync network, a sync, a sync node, which is the nodes that are highlighted um, or colored as pink in this network right here. So we call this hard thresholds um, pruning. So for example, it applies a transformation, anything that blobs, uh, drops below 0.8. So the range from zero to one, anything that drops below 0.8 just breaks it. Uh, this doesn't happen in WGCNA, it actually applies what's called soft thresholding, and that again is going to be something that we're going to look at once we visit the code. All right, so the next comparison that I want to make is uh, between WGCNA and SNCC, and actually SNCC is um, um, a software that was developed by uh, my Dr. Mike Schaeffer, he was one of the, he is one of the teachers who taught on um, uh, this webinar series. He taught the DRAM, he developed the DRAM uh, pipeline and he uh, taught um, on it along with uh, Dr. Michaela Porter. So SNCC, uh, um, SNCC stands for Sparse Co-Occurrence Network Investigation of Compositional Data. And I wanted to do this comparison just for this reason, to give you a perspective on absolute versus relative abundances and uh, what to expect from your ecosystem and the diversity in your ecosystem um, when you are trying to apply these different network analytics on that, okay? So um, again, I'm gonna do the comparison in the same fashion uh, that I did for MCL. Um, WGSNA, you start with your correlation coefficients, which exactly what happens with SNCC as well. Uh, you start with your correlation coefficients, you use them to build the edges in your network. Uh, the difference here is that the type of correlation coefficient that is used. So in WGCNA, uh, you have one of three options. You can use Pearson correlation, you can use Spearman correlation, or the default um, uh, mode is a bi-weight mid correlation. And the bi-weight mid correlation is basically a hybrid of these two. Uh, this is something that the um, developers of WGCNA wanted to have because both of these approaches have their um, drawbacks, right? So Pearson correlation, for example, is very susceptible to outliers and uh, they wanted to avoid this. But at the same time, if you use Spearman, now you are in the rank-based territory rather than the continuous data territory. So that's the reason behind using this bi-weight mid correlation uh, that actually try to uh, minimize the drawbacks of uh, these two different techniques. Uh, SNCC on the other hand uses the sparse correlations for compositional data or spark for short, spark correlation. This is um, a correlation uh, technique that was developed uh, for 16S sequencing data. And there was a good reason behind doing this. And I'm going to explain this on the next slide. So why people wanted to go behind um, inventing Spark or um, Spark CC, that's also something that I heard, but I'm 
going to refer to it as Spark. So people wanted to do this because they observed that um, the standard correlation methods, so like if you do Pearson or Spearman, can actually give you um, a lot of wrong uh, connections. So they, they started with simulated data in which they know which, um, uh, correlation sh which correlations should exist, which connections in the network should exist, and which connections uh, shouldn't be um, there at all. And they basically apply the two different uh, correlation techniques on the simulated data, and then they calculated the amount of error that you get in your network, okay? So anything that has red or dark color here, that is something basically have quite high uh, amount of error. And you can see Pearson here on the left, you can see that the majority of the box that is shown right here is actually red or dark, okay? And that is not impacted by the density of the network. So how dense your network is, but it's impacted by the diversity of the system. So this index right here that they have, it's um, an index related to Shannon's edge, uh, how many different types of microbes or viruses and how, abund uh, how equally distributed they are. But they call it the NF, which is, stands for the number of effective OTUs. Um, and this is something that they basically index that they used to uh, benchmark the, um, uh, the data that they used in the simulation. So the smaller the number, it tells you basically the system is not very highly diverse. The number, um, the, the higher the diversity in the system. So it looks like Pearson correlation, for example, if you try to go with a network that is dependent on Pearson correlations, and this uh, diversity system is very low. So if you're working with um, samples coming from vagina or the gut, then you are running the risk of having many of your inferred relationships um, wrong. Um, and they are just spurious correlations. They are just random edges emerging in your network, okay? You compare that to Spark and things look pretty nice. So now it doesn't matter what is the diversity of the system you have right now. Compared to Pearson, you have very low um, number of spurious um, edges in your network. It does get impacted though by the density in your network. So as the density increases, you get uh, more and more wrong connections, but still not to the extent where you get to the red and the black uh, area right here. So um, this is again like another display of the experiment that they did. So the, this is basically the, the start. Um, so this is the simulated data, the simulated network that they started with. And this is how Pearson correlation told you uh, network, what the network should look like. And this is how Spark um, is telling you what the network should look like. So again, you look here, you find that in high diversity systems, um, Pearson correlation or normal correlation coefficients can uh, do pretty well. And I just wanted to say this. So I did this whole comparison between WGCNA and SNCC for, for that specific reason. You have to be aware of the diversity in the system that you're working with. So there is a formula that they provided in this paper um, it is basically e to the power of Shannon's index, the Shannon's edge. Um, and this is the value that you get for the, um, N, the NF, which is the, the effective number of what you use, okay? So basically, once you get to a Shannon's of four or more, you start to get to the safe zone, basically. So 55 and, well, let's say um, above 25, if you are kind of the safe zone. Um, but again, if you are working with any of these low diverse systems, you want to be cautious about um, using standard correlation methods. So why am I telling you all of this? Because, uh, oh, okay. So here's one more thing before, before we go to the, this conclusion. Um, so I have seen also people doing uh, the trick of actually using the Spark correlation in WGC name. So they would actually compensate for this caveat for WGCNA and lower diverse system. Um, uh, and actually do some, like they develop some functions that you can um, add to your um, uh, code 
and that would allow you to uh, calculate the calculation in the Spark method. And okay, again, before going to the conclusion, let's just continue with the rest of the workflow. So we already know that the next step for uh, WGCNA is to get the scale-free topology network. Okay, so transformation on the edges. And um, the difference here between WGCNA and SNCC that it, uh, WGCNA always requires that you have this topology uh, so that you can actually do correct um, inferences from your network. Uh, SNCC doesn't assume this relationship, doesn't assume uh, scale-free topology, which is a good thing, but also a bad thing. So it's a good thing because um, we don't know if all of the relationships um, that exist in natural systems should follow this uh, scale-free topology. Um, so yeah, there might be um, different relationships that cannot be captured. And there are, I've seen some data that no matter how hard you try with the power transformation on the you never get the scale-free topology. Um, and when, again, when we go to the code, I'm going to show you exactly what I meant by that. Um, so yeah, so maybe it's actually not necessarily a good, uh, it's not necessarily attainable to get this scale-free topology. Um, but then also it's, it's um, the, the thing that is stifling here, on the other hand, is that you cannot calculate many of the um, uh, indices, if I might say, from your network for later on steps that are, for example, to do correlation analysis uh, with your metadata or your ecosystem output. So the next step is hierarchical clustering. We already discussed this for WGC in A, and also uh, SNCC does hierarchical clustering. Uh, the difference here is, again, the hard threshold versus soft threshold, as well as the type of linkage that is used in the uh, clustering. So by default, you use the average linkage in WGC in A versus single linkage in uh, SNCC. Um, and this is what I wanted to go to. So. Uh, one of the important things about WGCNA is that it's not just about constructing modules. It's not just about getting clusters. So the initial slide that I had for all of these different clustering techniques, uh, uh, the main purpose of them is to get um, direct quote unquote clusters, right? WCNA is actually not putting more weight on this, but uh, putting less weight on the correct clusters and more weight on the uh, connectivity within these uh, clusters or the modules. So they call this the intramodular connectivity. And um, this is important because it allows you to uh, infer what are the lineages that are hub in your module. So the hub genes and the hub um, uh, taxa. And also it allows you to calculate uh, the eigengenes. And this is very important for many of the things that WGCNA is doing. It allows you to, um, as we're going to see on the next slide, it's allowed to do, allowed you to connect to, uh, the clusters with each other, to connect the clusters with ecosystem output, it allows you to do um, connection between even different networks. And we're going to look at this on the next slide. Um, but they uh, basically say that this is the most important thing that is actually coming out from their network, this um, eigengenes or the eigenvectors, you call them eigengenes. And these eigengenes are basically the weighted average of the expression or the abundance of all of the genes or genomes within a module, okay? And um, this is, again, you can think about it as the first principal component and or the expression strength um, within this module. Um, they argue that this is utterly robust um, and it doesn't matter where you define your modules. So if you, for example, do the Haraka clustering and then you are very aggressive and cut at the three tips, you get like very fragmented um, uh, network or like you get like a lot of uh, clusters. Or even if you um, were not uh, very aggressive and you ended up having a sort of like bigger cluster, it's not uh, the end of the world, because as long as you have the eigengenes, you can still um, rectify this later on. So um, 
the hub genes that they refer to in these uh, uh, modules um, are basically things that you can know from the different outputs that the code gives you. So if you apply, for example, hierarchical clustering on your uh, network, these should be the things that are at the tips of these different branches. So uh, these are the hub taxa or the hub genes um, in your network. And if you are visualizing this into um, um, two-dimension space, so you're using multi-dimension scaling, for example, these things also should be existing at the tips of these fingers, if I might say, uh, for the different clusters um, in the 2D space. Um, so yes, eigengenes are important because it allows you to connect modules to each other and connect modules to other modules from other networks. So you can imagine now that you have a network uh, for your uh, microbial abundance and another network for your expression data. And now we would be able to um, link these two networks to each other using the eigengenes um, that are coming from the specific modules that are important to your system. Um, of course, the, uh, the whole thing here is done because we want to correlate our taxa and our genes to environmental variables, physiological data, clinical traits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And one of the important aspects here is allows the computation to happen. So because you have the eigengenes, uh, you can actually break your data set into smaller blocks. So this is the blockwise module um, modules function that we're going to talk about uh, go to the code um, and then do hierarchical clustering on these individual networks and then uh, join these different modules using their eigengenes. So if you walk in with a data set that has tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of taxa, that might be computationally um, deterring to do hierarchical clustering on all of them um, uh, or just conduct one, a single uh, um, um, yeah, dendrogram on all of these taxa. So breaking this into smaller blocks and then actually rejoining them later on is a smart solution for this computational uh, roadblock. And yes, and it also allows you to identify the hub genes because the intramodular connect connectivity is preserved and allow you to uh, relate the modules to their um, um, most important tax origins. Uh, an example is here is that there was an analysis that from which there have been different modules generated. And two of these modules, one of them is called the gray module. This is sometimes people consider like the all of the rejected taxa or genes that never fell into one of the uh, well-established clusters that just go to the gray module. So using the eigengenes and looking at the uh, relationship or the correlation between the different uh, modules can give you an idea about, well, actually these two clusters, these two modules should have been one because we have a pretty good correlation or relationship between uh, these two right here. So yes, you have low diversity compositional data. I would advise you to use something like Spark or try to use other network um, uh, analysis tools such as SNCC. Um, or if you are interested in the modules and you're maybe you don't have environmental data at all, you just want to cluster things because you want to look at the um, interacting units in your data set. Um, I also want to say something because this is something that people don't necessarily uh, know that WGCNA has two modes of constructing the network. So one of them is signed and one of them is the unsigned. Uh, so the developer, one of the developers actually recommends using the signed network, but the default is the unsigned. So you should be actually paying attention to this based on uh, the, um, the goals of your experiment or the goals of your analysis and your expectation of your system. So signed means that all of the things in the, in the module or in the cluster or in the network should be um, changing in the same direction, right? So all of them are um, increasing in the abundance together, decreasing the abundance together. Unsigned, it doesn't uh, require this. So you can actually have two taxes that are co-varying 
And by that, I mean, it's always that one of them goes up and the other one goes down. So that, that is going to be captured in the module um, in the network. And why does this actually even exist? Like, is it expected that the signed network is the, is the always the correct one? We don't know. I mean, if you are working um, with data set that you are interested in looking at uh, symbiotic relationship, then yes, you want to look at use the signed mode, signed modes of the network. But if you are looking at genes and some of these genes actually um, exist on the same uh, operon and there is autoregulation, then well, actually you would expect the unsigned network um, is a way to go here because yes, one of them always goes up and the other gene always goes down because of the autoregulation. Um, all right, so now we're gonna dive into the code. So I'm going to be basically, if you missed any of the things that I have said in this section right here, we are going to go over all of that again in this section, but this time we are going to be looking at the actual code and how to do each and, um, and, and, and every individual step, okay? So uh, the again, this code exists on um, the comms website, the page that's dedicated for the uh, webinar series, um, and the page that has all of the other resources from the other teachers as well. So um, uh, I'm just uh, I took just some snapshots, and I wanted to have some comments on uh, specific parts of um, that code. Um, the first few lines here are pretty straightforward. You are basically um, installing the packages that you need to run this kind of analysis or just uh, loading these packages if they are already installed in your system. And you are enabling uh, multi-threading. So again, I told you about the blockwise modules function that WGCNA has and it allows you to break your data set into smaller chunks and run them in parallel. And that's how you get um, uh, the fast computation from this tool. Um, the next uh, chunk of lines, so this is from 26 to 37, is just like you said, the directory on your local machine or in your uh, server, and you start importing the data um, uh, into R. Um, so I also uploaded these uh, data to the same link that has a code. And this data is kindly provided by the Bowman lab. Um, I brought it, for, I fetched that from uh, this link right here. Uh, they provided the data set and actually some of like the guidelines and tutorials um, about um, um, the, uh, how to run WGCNA from their perspective on, the, uh, on this kind of uh, data set. Um, it's kind of different. So the code that you are looking at here is actually modified from uh, the Guidi et al. paper that got published in Nature in 2016. Uh, but some elements also I think I adopted from the code that the Bowman lab um, has shared as well. Um, so yes, line 32 is just basically uh, reading the table that they have. Uh, so this table should look something like this. Uh, it has your OTUs as rows and it has your samples as columns. And these numbers right here represent their, their um, uh, abundance in the system. So these are the counts that we have from 16S. Uh, so the first thing that we do is basically transpose this data because we want to have our OTUs as columns and we have our samples as rows. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, the next step is to actually transform your data. And this is important because WGCNA was designed for expression data. And it is expected uh, from the perspective that uh, there is always some sort of expression, okay, low level expression, okay, like zero. You shouldn't expect a lot of zeros in your data set. Um, so, and the case that we're looking at here, if we're looking at microbial or viral abundance data or OTU abundance data, it's pretty common to find a lot of zeros in, in your table. Okay, so uh, that's why you need to do some sort of transformation. So this transformation here is the Langer transformation. Uh, so the function here, the decostant, and the method is Langer. 
And the Hellinger transformation is basically um, applying square root transformation on the relative abundance. And what that does is that actually decreases the distance between the things that you have zero here and the other values that exist in your table that used to be, um, you know, something 1000, et cetera, it's now 0.4. So by doing so, it gives lower weight um, to, the, uh, uh, to the variables that have low counts and, and a lot of zeros, okay. Uh, this line right here is not necessarily something that you have to do. So I just took it because they uh, thought carefully about their data set and they thought that this is something that worked well for data set. For their data set is to actually remove the genes or the OTUs that uh, had collectively uh, a relative abundance that is below 5% across all of the samples. You don't have to do this. I'm gonna show you on the next slide that um, there is a, a step that automatically does remove uh, the OTUs and the samples that are basically um, empty that can give you, um, or like it's, it's very, um, it, it, it's full of zeros basically across. So this is what I meant uh, uh, by automatically removing the bad samples and the bad genes. So this function here is called good samples genes, okay. Um, it's basically it takes in the uh, transform table that you have, the Hellinger transform table. And um, it basically stores that it creates an, uh, an object and like it, it tells you about uh, whether the data set is ready to go for WGC analysis or not, okay? And you do this by uh, basically going to, um, uh, but just typing, so we stored everything in this variable and just go to like uh, dollar sign all okay. And if it gives you false, that means you have some uh, samples that uh, have so many zeros, or you have some OTUs that are also zeros across. Uh, if this is the case, you uh, would run this chunk here of lines. So this chunk of lines basically um, goes through the genes and the samples. And um, if any of the genes, of the genes of the samples, um, uh, having their sum across um, equals zero. So this is not <laughs> larger than zero. Okay, so equals zero. Uh, it will basically remove these offending genes and samples from the data. So it cleans up your uh, table and you basically uh, rerun these couple of lines right here. And what happens is that hopefully you should be seeing that the value returns true. So that tells that everything is okay. We are having all the uh, columns and the rows, all of the samples and the genes in good status for um, going forward with the analysis. So the next few lines are also concerned with the quality control of the data. So it applies hierarchical clustering on the uh, samples on the samples, not the OTUs. And that's based on their similarity on the uh, profiles of the OTU abundance profiles, okay? And the purpose of doing this is to actually plot the tree or the dendrogram like this and start examining it. Because sometimes you would find that all of your data looks like this, all of your samples look like this, but then there is an outlier. There is like a loner, uh, branch, oops, there is a loner branch like, you know, coming from here and going all the way and it's all. So this sample is most probably going, it's very different from anything else and most probably it's gonna give you trouble uh, when you try to build your network. So it gives you an idea about, well, where should I trim my data before I uh, proceed with my analysis. All right, so now we are ready to build a scale-free topology network. And uh, these three chunks of lines, the first chunk is basically uh, calculates the, does the transformations that we talked about and then uh, build the, like it builds a network and applies a different transformation. And these two blocks right here actually plots the data. So I'm gonna show you on the next slide what the figures look like from these um, uh, plot, uh, plotting uh, lines right here. 
but basically you give it um, a sequence of powers that you want to use for the transformation on your network. So here it's basically one, two, three, up to 10. And then because it's going to be very busy, we just started to jump by two. So 12, 14, 16, etc., all the way up to 30. So this is the vector of powers that we're going to use iteratively on the network, on the edges on the network, and then calculate um, the connectivity in the network and calculate the, um, uh, the whether it fits the requirement for scale-free topology or not. And that happens on this line here, line 86. So this is the pick soft threshold. And this function is basically takes your input data, the transform data and the vector that you have for the powers. And you specify the type of network that you want, which in this case, I um, ask it to be a signed network. Okay. And it's gonna be, after you get this, uh, you are going to basically interrogate, go inside the uh, variable that's created here and fetch different indices and plot them. So the first one is going to be the model fit. Is it actually fitting the expectation of a scale-free topology? And the second one is the mean connectivity in the network, okay? And that should look something like this. So in the left, we have the scale independence. We have here the thresholds that we gave to the software. So we give one to 10 and then we jump it by two, right? So one, two, three, et cetera, up to 10. And then we jump it by two. Um, and it's the same X axis here as well. The Y axis is different between the two figures. On the left, we are seeing the, uh, again, the fit, um, whether the, this fits the model that we are expecting for scale-free topology. And the other one is for mean connectivity. So you look at this as a, like a perfect case. <laughs> so you don't necessarily see this all the time, okay? So you increase the power and you see that, well, it increases in its model fit uh, as you increase the power till you reach a point where it saturates, okay? And the purpose is to get the highest uh, fit, right, to your model. So naively, you would say, well, 24 is the best, right? But there is a caveat, and that's the what's other figure on the right is important. The caveat is, as you increase the power, you actually uh, break more and more of the edges in the network. So you might end up having just individual nodes, right? There are no connections whatsoever. So you want to balance. You want to have the highest um, scale-free topology fit possible, but also maintain uh, um, a decent number of connections of your network so that you can actually identify modules, right? So in this case, it looks like things slow down dramatically at 10. So this is the value that we're going to pick and we're going to continue with. Um, and you look here, it, it's not very clear on this y-axis, but it's around the average connectivity is around eight connections. Um, so yes, sometimes things will not look like this. Sometimes it will be like 9, 10, 12, and then drops and deteriorates. It's not going to always be looking like this. Sometimes it's just uh, all over the place. And that's why I told you um, previously that it's not necessarily going to be that in every single database, uh, data set that would have uh, the scale-free topology um, assignment um, fulfilled. So that's what we are doing right now. Now we pick the value of 10. This is the power that we are going to use to construct the actual network. This is the step that takes most of the time, the, the computational time, uh, which actually building the um, uh, topology overlap matrix and the network. And I'm gonna go through like these things um, uh, right now. But you, all of what we have done right now uh, so far was just to get the value here that um, satisfies the assumption of scale-free topology. The chunk of lines here is basically concerned with the parameters involved in building the network. So you start with the function that blockwise modules and uh, you give it a lot of different arguments. So you give it the table, the transform table, the heading of transform table, you give it the power 
that you have chosen. You give it the correlation type. This is where I told you you can choose Pearson, Spearman, or the uh, by correlation. You can choose the block size. So if your data set is not that large, you can basically change the number to include every single OTU in your data set. Okay. But if your data set is humongous, it's tens of thousands, then you want to break that into blocks that will run in parallel, and then it will be joined afterwards. You can specify the network type and the topology overlap matrix type, and you can choose whether they are signed or unsigned. And the reason behind using another uh, kind of like, a, so we, we said that we, um, when we construct the modules, we have the network, we have the hierarchical clustering, and we have this topology overlap matrix as well. And the reason behind getting this matrix is that it minimizes the spurious uh, connections in your network. So it doesn't look just at the direct connections, but also looks at the indirect connections. So uh, through intermediate nodes, etc. So that minimizes the um, variation or instability in the network. You can also uh, choose uh, the minimum size for your module. Usually you don't wanna go very, very low because um, you remember that next steps will be relating the individual members of these modules to your ecosystem output and other things. So if you go really low values, then most of your um, uh, regression analyses, for example, are not going to be strongly supported, statistically uh, supported, right? Because you have a small sample size. Oops. Um, the bunch of lines that follow are uh, more focused on the uh, dendrogram, so the hierarchical clustering that is happening. So this process doesn't happen just once, it actually happens multiple times. So it's an iterative process, and you allow it to um, change. So let's say that in the first iteration, it had three clusters and it assigned the module, uh, assigned the OTUs to these three clusters. But then in the second iteration, there was actually one of these OTUs uh, that should be reassigned to a different cluster. So when you give it a zero, you're basically giving it all the freedom to move things around in future iterations. Uh, the deep split here, it, it, this function uses what's called the dynamic tree cutting. So it does hierarchical clustering and it uses the um, um, values from one to four based on like, you know, the, the, the how deep you want to split the clusters in this hierarchical cluster. So it's not just one individual uh, height that you use to uh, cut your dendrogram. It uses more of like an, an adaptive um, and dynamic uh, cutting method. Um, you can also specify, you can force a specific height uh, at which you merge everything that is below. Um, so that is possible. So that's why I had it like, you know, very low value here. Um, you specify whether you want the labels for your modules to be numbers or colors. So if you specify false, it's gonna give you colors. And um, you save the, this, you make sure to save this because it takes a lot of time to compute. And if you don't save it, then you would have to run it next time. If you save it, that will be great because you can just import it in R and continue from where you stop. Um, you also allow it for the future iterations. So again, it does the process iteratively. You allow it to uh, give more weight to the dendrogram or the partitioning around med medoids. And uh, if you specify to false, that doesn't necessarily be uh, uh, bound to the dendrogram. And sometimes if you are having a lot of missing data, um, this line here fixes the um, missing data problem and the output file and the matrix, basically, the topology of overlap matrix. Right, we're getting closer. So uh, the, now you got your network, you got your modules. Um, the line here is just basically assigns colors uh, to the different uh, modules that are coming. And uh, basically, because sometimes people would ignore the gray module, and sometimes actually it's important. So this is something, again, the nodes that didn't fall into one of any of the of the, of the established clusters or modules. Uh, this just like, you know, removes the quote unquote stigma 
on the gray module it just gives them like you know random colors and then this is what you are using for um, the later on analysis so assigning colors we load the metadata now we have our modules it's time to correlate the individual modules to the metadata again the same um, lab has provided us with this uh, metadata data set and we calculate the eigengenes or the eigenvectors and this is calculated by this line here 147 um, it takes in your uh, language transform data and the modules um, that you have defined here and uh, and yes and you extract the eigengenes out of that these two lines are just reordering of these eigengenes based on their similarity. So things that look like each other, they would be um, next to each other in the data set. Or in the table, basically, that we have, which is called POPs here. Um, now we want to correlate the modules with the metadata. And the way to do this is basically by using the eigengenes that we have just calculated and stored in this uh, table right here, the pops here, okay? So this is a straightforward correlation analysis. This is a correlation function, and this is Pearson method. And you're correlating your metadata, all of the uh, different measurements that are, is, are in your metadata with the um, eigengene, uh, eigengenes that are represented as different columns in your table right here, okay? And you calculate the p-values that are associated with this as well. Uh, so you calculate the coefficient and the p-values, and you prepare all of that for plotting. So here, what you want to do is just generate a figure, um, a, um, uh, sorry, generate um, a heat map. Uh, this heat map would have uh, the correlation coefficients and the p-values between um, the uh, eigengenes or the modules and every single environmental measurement that you have in your metadata. And that's usually you want to save this as a because it's going to be like a really big heat map. So usually you want to save this as a PDF file or export it some in some sort so that you can open it outside um, the uh, console or uh, the standard viewing um, screen from R if you have an R studio. Um, so that is the heat map that we got from um, this data set. So uh, we look here, we find we actually only had four modules on the y-axis, and we have here a bunch of metadata measurements that existed in the table that the Bowman lab provided. And immediately you can see, well, we have here an interesting relationship between the Brown module and the upwelling. So this is not, of course, like, you know, it's, it's very rare to find correlations of one or negative one, um, but something that, you know, you should be uh, decent enough so that you can say that, okay, something happening in this module and we can start looking further, okay? Um, so, yeah, so that's basically what we're gonna be focusing on. So we're gonna select the brown module. We're gonna store it now in a variable called module and this is our metadata measurement. We're gonna store it as parameter. And we're gonna use this for all of the downstream um, analysis. And here we go. So we make a data frame. We're gonna store in it the metadata, para the parameter, right, that we have. And we are going to also get the, uh, uh, the modules not st stored there. Um, I think it's going to come on a next slide, but, but yes, so basically you just like went and just focused on the parameter of interest, right? So you subsetted your metadata table into just the column that you are interested in that has the parameter that was correlated, um, to your, um, uh, to your module, the brown module. Okay. And all of that, all of that is just cleaning <laughs> this column right here because it's not just the problem of having zeros in microbial data, it's also the problem of um, uh, having missing environmental measurements. So your metadata, as you increase the number of samples that you have, 
you would probably get uh, more and more of this missing data. So all of that, I'm not gonna go over all of these details, but basically it just goes and removes, for example, if you have, um, let's see, uh, for some reason I cannot see it. Like if you have NAs, yes, so NA omit function here, it will remove the NAs in your data set. And then it would go to the other tables and remove the corresponding uh, rows, which is like the corresponding uh, samples. So remember, if we uh, are working in with a table that has samples as rows and all to use as columns, it's going to remove the rows, the samples that also missing this metadata. So that's basically what's happening. And then you finally check that everything that you have is now uh, having the same dimensions. Oops. So um, so the Hellinger data clean is basically the original um, Hellinger transformed abundances. And uh, weight here is just basically the metadata right here. And this is the module. This is the eigen uh, genes that are uh, completed also. So this is the MB clean. It comes from POPs, which was basically the table that contained the eigen genes. Um, the next step is to try to ship to the uh, importance to the metadata or the ecosystem output. And these two chunks um, does two different things, and then we're gonna correlate these two things to each other, okay? So the first one is trying to calculate the module membership. And by that, I mean, it's just basically starting to directly correlate your transformed, linger transformed data with the eigen genes, okay? So this is how, we, again, we use the eigen genes right here in order to um, uh, um, identify module membership of which, um, which OTUs matter the most inside this module. On the other hand here, we are doing standard correlation between the data that is transformed. So no eigengenes here whatsoever. We are using here the uh, clean data, the Hellinger transformed data, and we're correlating that to the uh, metadata measurement that we have. You get both of these, you correlate them to each other against each other or plot them against each other. Okay. And um, again, this is just like, plotting lines and making things look nice automatically. Um, but this is something that you can see. And this is actually a pretty good relationship. Uh, X-axis here, we have the module membership. And on the Y-axis here, we have the significance of that specific OTU. So each one of these is an OTU to the, um, uh, to the environmental variable, which is the upwelling here. We have pretty cool linear relationship. Um, correlation uh, is decent, the p-value is pretty low. And you are also, you, you kind of like expect that you have more of the things on your module to be not really important and less of the things on your module to be really important. So again, this is a bunch of dots, a bunch of OTUs that should be under investigation. So that concludes the uh, WGCNA guided module definition. The next part is um, done independently. So by that I mean, yes, it does it on the metadata and the module, but uh, it, now is go it now goes back to the original table, the original transformed abundance table and start to do the regression, the cross validation and the um, uh, a variable extraction independently from what we have done. And that's again, that's why we're doing this. We're doing this because we wanna have different lines of uh, support um, for any conclusion that we wanna make about the specific um, set of OTUs, specific set of genes and the ecosystem output or the environmental measure. So um, we start this by actually setting for us some uh, baselines. So we start by applying or specifying a specific threshold for the R square and the regression from the partially square regression. So we are not gonna look at anything that is below 0 0.3. 0 
1.3 and above, that's maybe something that we are going to examine. Below that, it's going to be um, uh, disregarded. And uh, you get your subnetwork. So um, the subnetwork here again is the module, the brown module that we have uh, looked at in the previous slide. And you also get your metadata. And again, this is the uh, variable right here that's weight, and this is a subnetwork here. And you apply the partially square regression method um, on them, so regress them against each other. You also ask that you do right while you are doing the regression, you also do the validation. And the method that you're going to use is the uh, leave one out um, cross validation method. And also, you are using the um, um, orthogonal um, orthogonal scores for the partially square regression method. So by the way, orthogonal scores is something that immediately should remind you with the uh, ordination technique. Um, so for principal coordinate analysis, for example. So you have uh, dimensions, right? Each dimension is orthogonal to the, um, the lower one. So first dimension, second dimension, third dimension, fourth dimension, etc. So these are called also here components, okay? So you look at, for example, something like this, uh, and I'm gonna explain in a second what is that, but you'll find that um, the, uh, you have actually from this analysis different dimensions, different components, right? As many as uh, the number of samples that you're looking at. So what we are doing here is we are trying to look for the R square value Okay, so we did regression, right? We did here regression, partially square regression. So we are expecting an R square value coming out of that. Okay, and we are looking at the R square value through the different dimensions. So we're trying to look for the maximum R square value, but also the we want to stop at one point at the dimension that given us the maximum, because after that it plateaus or maybe deteriorates, etc. Right? We don't want to go to the forty-fifth dimension or 40 first component, that defeats the purpose, right? We wanna now just focus on the few uh, variables, few latent variables that are important for the ecosystem market. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's what this kind of uh, loop does here. We, uh, the first couple of lines is just basically saying, uh, setting up the, the, the limits for the for loop, okay? Um, and what it does is that it goes through the different components and starts to look at the R square value and sees whether it, it, it exceeds the threshold that we have or not, and uh, whether it's the maximum or not. And that's how it knows that it should stop at one point as it goes through all of these uh, components. Uh, so from this, basically, we stopped at the seventh component, and this is the R square value that we retrieved. Okay, and uh, that also it gets printed out on your uh, screen, that saying the maximum R square is 0.85, and that corresponds to component seven. Okay, um, that comes from the this bunch of lines right here. Um, you uh, wanna only go forward with decent R square values for the VIB analysis. And what we do here is basically just fetch the code, the source code for it from uh, this online link. And we um, uh, basically run it based on the R square value that we got. If the R square value is uh, zero, so uh, if the maximum zero, which means that it never actually exceeded 0.3 because the previous uh, loop was doing this. If it never exceeds 0.3, it's going to be converted to zero. Um, it says that, well, you know, bad luck. You should stop here. There is no good regression or correlation. You should leave here. But if you get like something um, like this, then it will say, well, you do have good correlation. Let's go forward with the um, VIB um, checking step. And that was this really big chunk of code does. So 
it would basically, uh, just to summarize things for you, it would calculate the VIP score. This is a function right here and store it into uh, this variable, the VIP result, uh, but also does other things. So it actually outputs different files for you. Um, so it will give you a VIP value for every single OTU in your module. Okay, so that should be stored uh, here. Okay, in this file here. So it's gonna be written to your uh, computer um, and it's gonna be storing OTUs versus the VIP score for them. Uh, you can also change how many uh, things you wanna look at later on. So this is basically looking at the top 100 VIP scores um, in the module. You can change that depending on the size of your data set and what you wanna um, say basically. Um, and you also get other two files here. One of them is just the standard Pearson correlation for the OTUs again. And the other one is the uh, uh, VIP correlations. Um, one of them is basically sorted for just these hundred and the other one is just for everything, okay. And this, what, uh, this is how they should look like, right? So these are the OTUs. Uh, this is the VIP score, again, OTUs, and this is the correlation, the Pearson correlation, not sorted, of course. And uh, this is the uh, ranking. So like if you actually sort these um, and rank these viral OTUs based on their VIP score, uh, what they should look like. Um, and now we should be done, but there are two different comparisons that you make from all of the data that you have acquired so far. Um, the first comparison is made between the measured and predicted values. So the output from the cross validation step, okay? And the second one, I'm gonna go back to this, of course. The second one is a comparison of the VIB correlation to the Pearson correlation. And if you have the selectivity ratio to the selectivity ratio, et cetera, okay? So let's start with the, um, the measured versus predicted values. So again, uh, uh, we are looking at the output from the cross validation, okay? And the importance of this is, well, okay, we got the data, we subsetted the data, we built a model out of the abundances of these genes or these taxa, and we were able to predict the, um, the environmental measurement, the ecosystem output, from just the abundance, okay? This is the prediction, this is the model that we built. How does this model relate to the reality? Okay, so how does that actually look if we compare it with the actual measurements um, in the system, okay? And it's pretty straightforward actually. So this is just a function that, um, you know, we have to, uh, in order to, um, uh, to get to just like plot the equation for the linear uh, regression and uh, this is just like the line that actually does the regression and this is just plotting okay we are plotting the predicted versus the measured uh, values and all of these are just um, the the beautification of the figure and adding the relevant data uh, to the figure so this is something that you can have uh, this is actually one of the pretty beautiful <laughs> results that I have seen from using WGCNA. Usually it's not that good. Uh, there is a problem or another. Um, and I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. So uh, again, this is things. This is the measured. Sorry, this is the, yeah, the measured here on the x-axis. So this is the uh, upwelling value that we actually measured in the field. Okay. And here we have the predicted value that we have based on the microbial abundance data or the OTU abundance data, okay? The black line here is the one-to-one -one line and the blue line here is the regression line. And uh, this is the R square and the P value. So this is really beautiful. Beautiful because you have the blue line is actually close to the black line. And uh, I mean, like it's not very skewed away from it. Uh, because sometimes you can still get high R square value and low P value. Um, and you still get the blue line, for example, looking like, I don't know, like, like that. And 
that tells you, yes, you are predicting things, but you are predicting the things out of the, uh, uh, not in the correct magnitude, okay? So you can track the changes of things, but it's not really simulating um, what is happening in the, in the ecosystem that you're studying. And usually when you wanna do something like this, you wanna have these two lines are very close to each other because um, if you are building a model uh, and this model is really sensitive or really crucial, you wanna have high confidence in the absolute values that you are given out of this model. Um, so that's one purpose or the other purpose is also strengthen the um, the uh, argument that you want to make about the role that this specific taxon or this specific role to you plays in the ecosystem. So this is the first comparison. The second comparison is actually a uh, very um, easy one to make. So this is the uh, just getting reading the tables that we have outputted a couple of slides ago, the normal correlation, the Pearson correlation and the VIP correlation and just putting them together and sorting based on the VRB. So uh, there's nothing fancy in this block of code at all. So it's gonna basically give you a CVS, um, CSV file um, that lists your OTUs that are sorted by the VRB score along with the correlation analysis. And if you remember something uh, that we have discussed during the theoretical portion uh, today that we said that we want to look at the taxa that has agreement between the VIP method and the standard correlation method. And that's because you can still get false positive from the VIP. Um, so for example, I would um, say that viral OT, the OTU here, number 11, and the OTU number 26 are kind of more of the things that I would uh, believe more than actually OTU number five. And again, OTU number two is just like, you know, this is very clearly a spurious <laughs> uh, VIB um, inference. So I wanna thank you all um, for being here today and for being around since March 2nd through this entire series of the um, webinar for the microbiome informatics webinar. Uh, we are really happy and on, on behalf of the teaching and the organizing team, we are really happy that uh, we were able to deliver this webinar to you and we are really happy also that you were able to be um, uh, with us along this long journey. Um, we had 726 uh, registrants from 53 countries. This is really impressive and, and made us really uh, appreciative of um, the importance that this webinar might mean to uh, people around the world. Um, again, we wanna thank you. Uh, and of course, um, we're gonna stay for any Q and A, but I just also wanted to say that um, we are also appreciating the help that we got from uh, the Ohio State University, the Center of Microbiome Science, the Emerge Biology Institute, the Infectious Disease Institute, and the funding also that was uh, provided by the NSF um, the Moore Foundation and the Arts and Sciences and Engineering Schools at OSU. Um, thank you so much again. And I think I will be uh, staying around with the panelists for any Q&A. And if there aren't a lot of them, uh, we will call it a wrap.